the interrelationships between different types of violence. While we recognize that violence comes in many forms, we pay much less attention to the ways in which these different forms connect. Exploring some of these interrelationships allows us to go deeper and begin to reflect both on the consequences of violence on individuals and societies, but also its causes. Perhaps we find connections between something we care about with something else we have dismissed as not important. Hopefully, we start to see both how our own actions matter, but also how we can create change. We may think of violence as existing on a continuum from smaller, often invisible acts to the extremes of war and genocide. Connections, though, do exist between these forms. Anti-bullying expert Barbara Coloroso noted that both bullying and genocide have something in common, contempt for the other. And when visiting Rwanda, the people she met there immediately saw the similarities. For example, between the dynamics Coloroso identified in schoolyards between bullies, followers, active and passive supporters, and disengaged onlookers with those that occurred in their country during the genocide. Extreme acts of violence, whether committed by individuals or collectives, have roots in lesser acts of violence. As socially sanctioned or legitimate acts of violence often happen alongside illegitimate ones, as so horribly illustrated by the large number of peacekeeping missions that have involved the sexual abuse of women, girls, and sometimes young boys. And while the experience of being a victim can increase one's concern for the suffering of others, unhealed wounds and the deep shame they engender can contribute to a preoccupation with one's own pain, as individuals, but also as societies, and often turn victims into perpetrators. Perhaps the most revealing representation of the connections between different forms of violence is provided by Johann Galtung's famous typology of direct violence, cultural violence, and structural violence. When represented by the triangle, typically we see direct violence, or the physical or verbal assaults inflicted by identifiable perpetrators on top, with structural violence, or the suffering inflicted by the rules and policies of social, political, and economic systems, and cultural violence, or those aspects of a culture that justify the harm being done on the base. But this triangle can rotate. When thinking about violence against women, for example, structural inequalities have arguably been more noticeable. While what serves to produce and sustain them, the direct violence often inflicted on women in their intimate relationships, and the cultural roots of devaluation, objectification, and the centuries-old but still relevant ideas that justify rape remain far more hidden. And indeed, it is difficult to see much progress on these foundations of patriarchy. What Galtang's triangle reveals is that all forms of violence are mutual reinforcing. If you want a less violent world, reduce social equality and the devaluing of others. That's doable, no? As psychologist James Gilligan once remarked, violence prevention is being limited more by a lack of will than by a lack of know-how. We know what to do, but we are just not doing it. Why not? Could it be that we are ourselves shaped by all those ideas that normalize and legitimize violence, while devaluing nonviolence as a meaningless and naive idea? As Theodore Rodzak once said, people try nonviolence for a week, and when it does not work, they go back to violence, which hasn't worked for centuries.